you Matt Boston, how you doing? Hoping some people are gonna join us live, but we're just uh, uh, hoping if you watch these videos, it's really uh, cool to be cool to uh, do this and to uh, help support our animal company. If, if colleagues like you, Matt Boston, don't step up and do what they're doing and hire us to do things, it's gonna be very hard to keep all these animals alive. So we really appreciate you, Matt Boston. Be awesome if the students can tune in live um, because it's too early or whatever. Um, it would be great if you could watch me and I'll tell you some questions. So, you know, that would be great to make an interact. Okay, so I'm Ed, Animal Ventures, and uh, we're going to start off with covering South America today. South America. Then we'll start off with something that you don't need to find in the wild. That's really cool. This is a little guinea pig. And everybody always thinks guinea pigs are from South America. There is a form of a guinea pig, like a paca um, and other animals that are similar. But the guinea pig that you see right here in front of you, this is a domestic animal uh, that does not uh, live in South America. There are larger variations of paca as opposed to one. And uh, we do not have a pack of that. Um, so uh, when you go to a pet store and you get a guinea pig, it's a completely domesticated animal. You can hear some of our animals that aren't quite as domesticated, uh, making lots of noise over here. In, uh, in uh, South America, uh, they do see, you know, we call guinea pigs, they, they do call certain animals like pack of guinea pig and they do eat them. So it is a food source. They're bred for food, uh, pet trade, other things like that. Um, but these domestic ones are just nice if you need, you know, a little animal to keep your company at home. They're not real high maintenance, so uh, they can be vocal, but they're a pretty cool little animal. Lots of jungle noises in here today. Actually, feels like South America with all these noises. That is a little guinea pig. And uh, let's see. Let's see here. Oh, really cool. So this is really cool. This is a toad from South America, a Bufo Marine, it's a cane toad. And these are the ones that were introduced to Australia. Uh, they love to pee a lot. Well, we have, these are actually genuine brown toads. They're not the lookalikes, so you know we're working with cane toads, you need the real thing. So these are the ones that were introduced to um, Australia. Really quite silly. They took, um, I have inside sources that tell me that the number was 103 of these um, toads were released into Australia and they are supposed to eat the cane beetle. The problem, this is why it's not good just to research in the lab. You've got to get out into the wilderness and observe things for yourself. So the scientists, um, they decided to release the cane toads into Australia to eat the cane beetles that were destroying the cane crop. The problem is, these toads can jump, you know, a few feet forward. They're not going to jump up in the air and snatch things out of the air. And the cane beetle spends its time on the top of the plant. And toads can have thousands and thousands of babies, right? They lay eggs and they change and clusters. And they have all these little uh, baby toads, and they grow quite quickly. They can get larger than this. And then uh, they eat a lot of the natural and the bugs and things like that. The, uh, and things that uh, are native, and then other animals that are you know, they eat these and they die because if you see the sweet glands right there, those are full of toxins that can kill an animal if they eat them. So uh, the only animal that successfully hunts these um, is the kawadi, which we're going to meet a rare species of kawadi, which uh, some people call the kawadi, which is a raccoon from uh, South America. Uh, South and Central America, and now Texas and Arizona as well. And what they do is they uh, grab the toad and they slice open the glands with their paws to wash all the toxins out when they eat them. So raccoons are pretty smart. Um, I know some people that would have thought of that, so uh, raccoons are a pretty smart animal. But uh, in my opinion, I'm going to give you guys facts and give you my opinion. My opinion is uh, these toads really, uh, any animal should not be introduced to your. It's not uh, native to just cause these problems. You don't think far enough ahead, enough steps ahead to realize all the problems that we have to cause. So, really cool animal. Uh, cute little animals for a, a pet as well. You just don't want to hold them in their face. You don't want your hands dirty. 
Okay. Now, let's see Kawada. And Kawada is love, smell, different kinds of things. Have a little bit of a little bit of a little bit of smell on the table. Kawada, they're not alive, but they love to love to smell. So, a little bit of smell. It's over here. And I'm back. What this is little Jay, and Jay is an Eastern Mountain uh, Kawadi. These guys are from the Clouded Forest in South America. The Clouded Forest is uh, a very important part of the world because it provides uh, clean water. Uh, for at least five major villages in South America. So the mountain quality is very important. Its habitat is very important. And uh, one of the things that is threatening the habitat, uh, which is threatening a lot of uh, South America major regions, is uh, illegal logging. Uh, we can discuss logging and illegal logging in pros and cons. But one thing we know before is illegal logging uh, we, is a disaster. Uh, they destroy the rainforest, they destroy the animals that live there, and after they take off their logs, they generally light it on fire. Captain in the Amazon in 2019, most likely it's illegal logging, I think, uh, it was a problem where they cut down all the trees and all the underlying brush, they, just, they light it on fire to clear it to uh, give the land illegally to uh, soy, uh, mostly soybean. Uh, farmers and cattle farmers. I know everybody loves soy. Truth is about soy is once you plant, you can research yourself and you plant soybeans, soy is that land is pretty much not eaten. Soy is really a terrible product um, for the environment, um, which I don't mind because I don't like soy anyway, so it works out well for me. I'm more of an almond milk, coconut milk type guy. And even then, you have to be careful of the how it's grown, uh, harvested, and all that. So illegal logging is uh, devastating, um, and we have other animals we're going to talk about. Uh, you know, some other things that are good and bad, and what's going on in South America. So I'm going to have a little bit of that. <laughs> Part of the video, the dog says, I never clean up that for myself. Well, there you go, I just did, right? Keep going. One of the messiest, uh, but one of the animals I really love. This is a uh, red foot tortoise, and they give them the name Red Foot um, because they have red on their feet. This uh, particular species is called the cherry headed red foot because um, they have the bright red in the head there. And the dark shell, the way you tell a cherry head from a regular uh, tortoise is with the flash on it, so it'll be all dirty because she was in the dirt and everything. But I'll we'll show you. So the black plastron, which is the bottom of the turtle or tortoise, um, if it's red like that, that's a true cherry head. And then they, have, they don't get as large as the regular. Uh, Tortoises. Again, these animals here live in the rainforest of South America. And uh, Brazil, over the last few years, has actually gone the other way with conservation. A lot of South America, Amazon, 
making some progress. Brazil, um, I believe their government is fairly corrupt right now, and they are literally, as far as environmental uh, protection and laws and animal poaching, have gone the other way so well. A lot of South America has been making gains to Brazil with that. From my, my research, so we've been going the other way. That's one of the most important point to is uh, corrupt uh, government. Um, sorry for that, I can't even really understand. Tripping over, I don't know what's going on over there. But these are a nice uh, um, tortoise, they don't get too big. You can get them as hatchlings, as captive born, so you're not taking any out of the wild. And they'll probably outlive you, and you can get 100. 200 years out of the world to pass it down to your children. So, uh, really beautiful, uh, beautiful. Thing. Okay. Let's see what's over here. Maybe now. A lot of things are going to be annoyed. Okay. This is my good friend, Tiki. Yeah, I and this is a uh, Sunday conyard. When you cross a Gen Day and a Sun conyard, you get a Sunday. And it is the South America, uh, Brazil, uh, these guys. Um, the big birds, they you know, travel quite a bit, have a fairly large uh, range, and uh, they're born. They're, this one here is bred in captivity. Uh, I think Pinky was dropped off here about 10 years ago, so we're kind of, I'm really bad with time. It's been at least 10 years. Uh, she's just awesome, and they'll live a long life 50 to 75 years. As far as pets go, they can be quite noisy. Um, you know, but they're pretty cool. We really love and enjoy her. Birds are obviously are very important because they are certain to see the person that, you know, will start their intelligence and go into a long spiel on it. But you know, a bird, you know, get seed, they fly, drop seed, and the seed grows, right? So, a very important animal. Um, I do want to talk about poaching a bit today just because um, I know, you know, this is 2020, uh, but poaching is still a very real. Uh, thing and uh, birds are, uh, you know, are heavily poached. The uh, United States actually does a fantastic job um, on, um, you know, like not having poached animals coming into our country. The UK does a really decent job. Uh, Africa, uh, Asia, uh, China. I don't always want to pick on China, but I'm sorry. Do your own research. Uh, I'm not picking on Chinese people, but I'm just picking on the government and the officials. Is that uh, China? Is on the top list of everything that is bad in Brian. Um, everything. There's no nice way to say it. I don't care about food, food, food pressure, hurting someone's feelings. If you want to know research, you want to know what to do, here you go. China is the number one uh, importer of ivory. Uh, disgusting. They're number one um, you know, importer, most likely, of, uh, well, it actually is the number one importer of the Jaguar. Okay, and they import the jaguar for clothes, jewelry, and medicine. All right, the Chinese culture. I was interested spent a lot of time in China. They illegally have poaching, and the Chinese government keeps saying that they're working against it and passing laws, but they're doing not much. Okay, because I believe it's very, they're very corrupt over there. Um, I've seen it firsthand, spent a month uh, living there. So, um, I would just, I don't know what to do about China. You know, they have to be held accountable for many things. Uh, and um, I don't know how you do that. But in the world of animals, there is no bigger enemy probably to animals and conservation than uh, China. And again, not the Chinese, I have Chinese friends, right? I'm not saying, you know, it has to Chinese friends. I'm saying the Chinese government, something has to change. Um, if, until they do something, I don't, I don't know what we can do. I mean, when you can look at a jaguar, Beautiful animal, and then just kill it for its teeth and fur. I'm not an animal like that, but people know me. I'm not an animal, I love animals, but I'm not an animal like that. So, I believe that PETA and all those organizations are a terrorist organization and shouldn't exist, um, you know, based on research, not on feelings. In the animal business, you better get rid of your feelings and emotions and go with facts. And uh, the fact is, uh, China um, is the biggest enemy to uh, the animal kingdom. Do your own research. Okay. 
So I'm passionate about conservation, so when I talk about it, I, I know. I get fired up, sorry. I don't mean to insult people, but it, it is what it is. Uh, all right, this is mystery animal. I don't know what's in this box. Mystery. Hopefully it's friendly. I'll open it towards Chris and Chris is just young. No, friendly. I'm going to open um, This is Mordecai. We're actually going to see two armadillos today. And Mordecai is a three banded uh, southern armadillo from Brazil. And um, there are about 22 species of armadillo. Again, the taxonomy, the classification of animals is always up for debate. Um, you know, but about 22 species. And this is really is the only one that can roll up into a ball. There is another one uh, uh, that they say rolls up into a ball, but it's really the same animal, it's just a little further north, I believe. Um, I have to check my facts in your room. But this is the only one that rolls up into a ball completely. They have a triangle head, a triangle tail, ears are folded in half. And uh, you can see the only animal that can break the shell of this animal is the jaguar, which we were just talking about. Uh, this is one of the only armadillos, or if not the only one, that sleeps above ground like this. So what it'll do, you saw here has like torn up newspaper and stuff, it's like to make a nest. When they sleep, they'll take the leaf litter and substrate and they'll uh, make a pile. And they just literally lay on their sides like this and um, sleep like that. They don't have to sleep underground. They can dig and go underground. They have big paws to the front. And they actually walk on their claws. The armadillo is an insectivore. They have small... Uh, Fairy armadillos that are a few ounces or a few inches to the very large giant armadillo that reaches uh, like five feet long and 70 pounds. So, this animal, uh, with quite a variation in size. This is one of the small ones, the three banded armadillo from Brazil. His name is Mordecai. You can see he's skipping. Eyesight is not good. Hearing is good. Sense of smell is excellent. And you can see he's walking around sniffing. If I put bugs, ants, or something here, they would, he would sniff them and eat them. If, uh, there was uh, ants running or any bugs running underneath his body, his ears would feel it, and then he would know they were there and he'd turn around as a little wind up for it would look like and he would um, see so here. We're going to see another larger armadillo. Is this animal nocturnal? Yes, so this animal is uh, nocturnal. They are what you call crepuscular, where they'll get up in the morning before the sun. Um, and then they will uh, you know, uh, sleep all day and get up at Mostly, the most active time, the most uh, uh, amount of hours will be in the evening. Yep. So actually, uh, all armadillos, I believe, except one, are uh, considered uh, nocturnal. And um, the diurnal animal, the daytime animal armadillo we actually have, Fast Tony making all that noise. He's the handful. We're going to try to get Fast Tony next. Thanks for signing in. Appreciate that. All right, Fast Tony. This is Fast Tony. He is a handful. <laughs> uh, he is, um, uh, uh, you know, obviously an armadillo, and this guy is a much larger species of armadillo. You can see, if you look at the bands, they call this one sort a of six banded armadillo from, from South America. They don't always, my three banded armadillo has um, almost four bands, the six banded armadillo has almost seven bands, so they're not exact. You know, six or three or seven. But this is a you know a mid-size, small to mid-size armadillo, but he's many times bigger than Mordecai. And this one cannot roll up in a ball. You can see right here, I'm holding it to the side. He can fold up pretty good, but not all the way in the ball. Doesn't really have to because he can take his head and put his head down. He has the armor on, on his head there. And a lot of people think armadillos do not have teeth. They have soft teeth in the front and the back. They have very powerful teeth. And they, uh, you know, a lot of fruits and, and things like that, but they also eat um, rotten animals, you know. So if they find carrion, you know, an animal that's sitting there decomposing, they'll you know, eat some of that, and they need those big molars in the back to do that. Um, Mordecai, the first one you saw, is mostly soft-shelled insects, but this guy here, Fast Tony, can eat larger insects as well. 
So he, his favorite thing is really uh, fruits and vegetables. You know, you give this thing an avocado, and he thinks it's you know life doesn't get any better. Uh, he's not as friendly as uh, Mordecai. He's pooping on me. And what we give him is an insectivore pellet. It's a tiny little pellet. And then we give him um, avocado, some, sometimes mealworms and crickets as a treat. And then we give him a sweet potato. We have to try to shred that up for him pretty good. And you know, they're, they're nice, they're dirty animals. Uh, he does bite sometimes. I have to watch my hand to grab hold of one of our staff members' thumb and give a really good bite. Surprise him. They're all surprised how strong of a bite that he had. Uh, their shell is strong, it's made out of keratin, much like our uh, fingernails, and uh, that will give them a fair amount of protection, but it's not going to protect them uh, from the jaguar, which is because of a very hard, hard bite. But uh, I wish you guys could enjoy some of the smell that we're going through right here. <laughs> it smells terrible. Uh, the big question we get about on the go is who they carry that with? If you go to South America, you may be offered armadillo. Okay, I would say don't eat it. The way you get leprosy is to eat undercooked armadillo. So armadillo sushi is an absolute no. Um, I just wouldn't trust it. I would not eat armadillo. Uh, I don't like. I try not to eat animals of my own. When I first started about 14 years ago, I ate bacon, and then I started coming to the sweet smell of bacon. But um, yeah, so I would just avoid armadillo. If you don't eat the armadillo, uh, you should be fine. Fast Tony, you are a handful. You are an absolute handful. All right, we'll put him back here. We have to the mat. And let's move on to so do a boat inspector. Oh, Chris. Fast Tony. You want to work with animals, this is always going to be part of your life. Feeding up food. There's no escape. It's actually probably the easiest part of the job. You need a mental break, it doesn't take much thought. Sometimes, it's not a lot. Of All right, now we're going to see a snake called a boa. This is a little pet store. They will probably, if you buy a boa, they'll probably call them a common boa. A Colombian, uh, they call it a red tail boa. It's not a red tail boa, it would be a common or a Colombian boa. If you're going to buy a true red tail boa, it's going to be um, a lot more money. I think Chris is technically important. Let's do it. I would definitely think we need to enjoy it. Okay. This guy here. Needs an official uh, cool name. The staff is all over the place. We try to have everybody agree on names. Their names are everywhere. So, probably got my 11 year old daughter. Pick a name. She's probably the best at it. It's a really beautiful boa constrictor. Uh, it would be called a Colombian uh, boa, a common boa. It's actually the Tronomos of Colombia. But there are different variations of boas that are found throughout uh, South and Central America. And you can see this one here it has, you know, uh, kind of a darker tail. If this was a true red tail, the, uh, the tail would be like a really beautiful, beautiful red. And, um, you know, those would be called the surnames and dying and boas, which cost a lot more money than a common boa. They're nice animals. They can grow, you know, 10 plus feet, weigh, you know, 20 to 60 pounds. Or typically, they say 20 to 30 pounds, not more than that. Uh, but they can, they can get bigger than that. The other thing about boas is you don't want to put them around uh, your neck uh, or body. They're very, very strong. Um, everybody loves to put snakes around their neck. This snake, I guess, can easily snap on it. Uh, the other thing that it can do is it's around your neck and body, it can come up and grab your face. And they have, uh, you know, probably close to 100 sharp little teeth in that mouth. If you grab your eye, your eye keeps gone. So you really don't want to stay near your face or around your neck or your uh, body. All right, we'll put this one in and we'll move on to the next one. 
I'll be right back. I'm going to run back soon up there. Have himself a party. One second. The next animal we're going to see is called a Pikachu. I was actually on the phone right before this about a Pikachu rescue. And um, we're in another state, so we're trying to work out all the galleries and everything like that. But, so. This here is Nadia. This is Nadia. This is my female king. I have her and her brother Dobby. Uh, Dobby is a boy. This is her brother. And this is a girl. And uh, King can just live up to 30 years. Uh, Nadia here is about seven years old, maybe eight now. And they have a prehensile tail. It is the only non primate mammal that we know that makes elaborate. Um, trails and uh, homes through the canopy of the rainforest. So primates will make a nice bed out of leaf litter, leaves and things like that. And the king do the same thing. So it is a member of the raccoon family. The Kawadi that you saw earlier is a member of the raccoon family. And then um, the red, you know, the king uh, the red panda is also in that family. So they're all related. Now they look cute and everybody wants them as pets. Right now she's behaving. She can be ferocious. I've seen some bad people do attacks. I'm not against people owning exotic animals. I would just say, man, you'd have to, you know, be the exact right person for a kinkajou. They're super, super messy. They're extremely nocturnal. And, um, you know, if they decide they don't want to behave, they do bite really, really hard. They kind of like jump at you and uh, attack you. It's not very fun. A uh, cool thing about the kinkajou is their fur runs backwards. So when they're in uh, the rainforest hanging upside down, then the water runs off the back. And as you know, you see she's shivering a little bit. It's nice and warm here, but she just woke up because uh, she's very nocturnal. But even in a uh, rainforest, you can get hypothermia. The animals that uh, you can get hypothermia if they stay soaking wet and not have a chance to dry. So the water running off their body is pretty important. You see the long whiskers for feeling. Uh, yeah. Yeah, I feel it. And this here is a little bit of a blueberry donut. She usually likes uh, a little bit of a sweet. They have a very strict diet. In the wild, though, they love sweets. They're also known as night monkeys because they act like monkeys a lot and they're up all night. They're also known as honeybears because you can go online, right? go on YouTube and look at videos of kinkajous, you know, their heads and beehives eating all the honey. They love to eat this flower. It looks like an upside down bell. They hang upside down by their tail and their long tongue comes out. Their tongue is like six inches long. It'll come out and it licks all the nectar out of the flowers. One cute thing is the babies, uh, they don't know they're supposed to keep their eyes above the flower to look for predators. So uh, they're only supposed to use their tongue to get all the nectar out. The baby kinkajous, they're first learning. They take their head and they stick their whole head in the flower and they come out and they're covered with, uh, with um, you know, pollen and stuff. It's pretty, uh, it's pretty cute. So if you want to look up cute kinkajou videos, but I'm telling you, don't want those kinkajous to convince you into buying one. Um, really, um, I would never have one as a pet. I love them here as an educational animal, an ambassador, but not as a pet. Um, that's just my, my strong opinion. Now, as far as, let's talk a little bit more about uh, animal poaching. Kinkajous are poached, squatties are poached, monkeys are poached, sloths are poached. There are illegal uh, ways of obtaining them, but they are still heavily approached. 
Um, so the United States was part of a big meeting in 2017. She wants to go, and I don't want to make it out. Um, there were 27 countries, mostly from Latin America, seven places represented, and the United States was one of them. 2017, uh, President Trump signed a very strong conservation bill into play. So this bill escalated poaching and put it amongst the top four things. So you have uh, uh, you know, illegal um, gun trade, which is very big. Um, uh, you have um, illegal uh, drug trafficking. You have uh, illegal human trafficking. Those are the, uh, the real big, always the big three, uh, human trafficking, drug trafficking, and um, gun trafficking, illegal. Now, we have uh, President Trump in 2017 added that same list of uh, animal trafficking. So now, uh, more ties in the office. Uh, now, since uh, President Trump has signed that bill, um, the first one of its time, the animal poaching is now elevated to the top four uh, things being watched and people being prosecuted for. So that was an excellent thing in 2017. Um, remember, when you put the word illegal, that means it's illegal. So you know you can't buy an animal uh, that's you know in the country illegally because you're just helping the cause. Um, whether we agree with all the laws or not, you know, or they tell our children, we, just, we can't break the law, we can try to change it, we cannot break the law. Uh, also, uh, the deforestation, you know, legal logging companies do a pretty good job as a great biodiversity, but there's legal logging. Uh, then uh, there's uh, parks that set up. And the reason is the legal logging companies have the money to protect their land. Uh, the downside to that is illegal logging companies can come on, but they won't stop protecting. Properly, not every company does it the right way, and use those access roads to then uh, tear down uh, illegal uh, forestry. So uh, you got to really do your research. The supporting groups, you know, you got to research the past, present, and the projections for the future. You can do some good and bad and everything. Of course, illegal human trafficking, illegal drug trafficking, illegal gun trafficking, illegal animal trafficking. Uh, trafficking is all all bad, hundred um, percent. So anything that can be done to stop that, obviously, is good. Uh, the other thing that came to do is several years ago, the Swiss came in and built all these mega hotels that became in Central America, in Costa Rica. Um, and the brother has a little house in the jungle there, in this place. And uh, when the uh, Swiss came in and started building all these mega hotels and different European, uh, European uh, countries came in, companies. Uh, the pink and blue for the first time where video tape coming out of shoes and on the building. So, um, human encroachment, yes, the development, poor development that's going to be done uh, well, uh, thought out, well researched. Uh, and, you know, I think countries that have the money need to be careful that they're not taking advantage of countries that don't have the money. That seems to be uh, a big problem. I know uh, times can set up with a lot of land uh, in, in South and Central America. Africa, uh, Asia, and um, they, all, they own the land there, so there's things that can be done there um, that are not good for the environment. So, um, you have to be careful that the countries with the money don't take advantage of these uh, poor countries. So, so any, any business deal, as long as it's good business deals, and both parties are, are happy, right? So, uh, there are a lot of things that we need to do. Yep, let's see. Let's see. Get more go the monthly. Chris, can you set that camera so you can have to put a new gun to the food on that? I'll hold it and you can buckle that around and screw it up. It's going to have an extreme tantrum tendency. Is anybody going to get through? No. <laughs> Oh, ready, Chris? I'm going to load you around right in front of his front yeah. Broke down. What a good boy. 
This is Bojo. He's one of my favorites. <coughs> Not that I try to have favorites, but he's just so cool. Uh, the way he goes poop on me and he's on me and pulls my hair and steals my food. Uh, so he's an awesome little monkey. He is a black cap squirrel monkey. He has quite a story. He was born uh, in skin, a behavioral research program, and he was stolen by an older monkey from his mom, which monkeys are cute, they're very dirty, can be very aggressive. Um, yes, they can be smart as well, um, but often uh, monkeys will kill each other's babies and all that kind of stuff. So he was born inside of a uh, behavioral research program and the grant stated that any new monkeys that were born that could not survive on their own, could not stay in the program. So he was born in there and an older monkey was gonna, took him from his mom and was just gonna starve him to death. He was then taken from that mother and then I got a call Long, long story. We sent someone to meet meet people in South Carolina and Florida and set up this whole rescue thing, had to make a large donation to the organization doing the fun. Uh, if not, they just euthanize things like this. So they don't find a good home for them. And so we, um, my family sacrificed a lot that year, vacation and everything to get Mojo here. And that was the four years now, four years ago. And, um, Looking for bugs, took a shower, probably not gonna find much, maybe one or two. Um, and so the black cat squirrel monkey, one of the smaller monkeys, obviously there's the little, little mouse uh, lemurs and things, uh, sorry, marmosets and stuff, not really marmosets that live in that area. Uh, but it's one of the smaller primates in the Amazon. When you think of the Amazon, you think of all giant animals, but this here is um, you know, a very small animal that survives in the Amazon. Now the typical squirrel monkey, the common squirrel monkey has the blonde head. Um, and you find them in uh, Central and South America as well. But this one here is limited to the Amazon uh, basin. And uh, yeah, in the wild, he lives in a troop of about 25. Here he lives next to another monkey, but he's by himself right now. So if you get a chance to take in another monkey of this kind to give him a friend, he will. But he does get a lot of interaction and time to try to make up for that. So this is most. Uh, the squirrel monkey. The Amazon last year had a tough year. Um, you know, with uh, fires that were spread in the Amazon. And again, that was most likely, um, it's, there is, they actually call it rainforest monkey. And you can look that up yourself. But there is what they call the rainforest monkey that goes in and they kill the villagers that live there. Um, and they take the land and they, uh, Harvest it for uh, soybeans is a large one, cattle grazing is another large one. Um, and they work a lot in conjunction with illegal logging companies who go in, devastate the uh, habitat, and then they light the fires, as we talked about earlier, to clear it out for the um, you know agriculture to come in and those fires get out of control. Um, when you illegal log, you don't worry about taking care of the dead woods and all that. That lay there. And I know in California and places that have these giant mega fires, a lot of it could be prevented if they would take away the dead wood. I was hiking in Colorado and they have a, a law in this particular area I was in, they're not allowed to take the trees out. There are trees, just dead trees everywhere, uh, laying down some from invasive bugs and other things. And you see the fires they have in Colorado. And no matter how many fires they have that destroy, all the habitat and people's homes and lives, they will not change the way they do things. So it's common sense. There's a lot of dead wood lying there. Um, I know there are insects and other things that make your home. These things will move on. Uh, what, what is more devastating? Uh, you know, thousands of acres of fire or, or moving dead wood? I uh, would strongly suggest the thousands of acres of fire do far more damage to the animals uh, than the environment. Now, of course, people are doing all after the fire, things grow back so beautiful. You know what? If you took the wood out, you wouldn't kill all those animals, destroy its habitat, and things would still grow beautiful. So, legal, legal logging done right, done right, uh, is, is key. I think legal logging done right, they uh, harvest the right trees, they, uh, they don't destroy the habitat, they don't sell uh, the sell the land to soybean farmers or cattle ranchers. And again, I know cattle, you know, you need to have cattle uh, places the cattle to graze, but everything has got to be done right. There are several uh, companies that, that do it right, and there are some companies that, that do it wrong. So um, the key is to have the people that you have protecting the area making enough money so that they're not tempted by the money. 
uh, what they call the rainforest mafia or poachers or anything like that. So um, you know, that plays a big part of uh, of you know what we can do what, what we can do in South America, Central America. You just really have to research for yourself. Be well rounded. Don't get um, you know taken in you know by anything. And I would like to just I'll probably end with this one here. Well, I think we'll end with Mojo. This will give you guys 45, 50 minutes of uh, stuff to watch. But please, we welcome all questions, all comments. Uh, I love being wrong. It doesn't happen much, but you know, if, if you're wrong about something, right, that means you learn. If somebody, so if I'm wrong about some facts, uh, you have a good argument. I love to, the way I like to, you know, argue with debate, it's not really argue with debate, it's just discuss so everybody can learn. Because if uh, you're wrong about something and you realize you're wrong, you just learned something. If I'm wrong about something, you know, and I just learned I was wrong, I just learned something. So if you ask my wife, I'm learning a lot every single day, right? So, hey, thanks for tuning in. I really hope you guys watch this. Uh, remember, not uh, all colleges are doing what UMass uh, Boston is doing. So take advantage of their generosity. It's helping us. Gosh, I think last is the one nice thing I own in the table. So uh, thanks a lot. Next Wednesday, 12 o'clock, and I think what we do in Asia, we'll be studying Asia. Should be really, really cool. See you then. <coughs> yeah, we're